Awesome. Well, welcome to Vox, everyone. This has been a particularly Voxy morning. We're starting at about 20 after 10. Uh, so, so uh oh, oh, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> well, let's uh, got a lot of stuff planned. Um, Marilyn uh, volunteered to do the opening prayer. So you want to dive in? Oh, sure. That sounds good. Or come on, maybe come closer to the computer. So it's, here. it's a really boxy morning. <laughs> um, am I looking at it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I just want to share uh, with you all that 20 years ago today, January 14, 2024, I asked the Lord to use from in my life be my savior for forgiveness of my sin and i'm really glad i did that and thankful for god in my life the path and people that have come into my life and box is now part of my faith story thank you lord and box also the scripture psalm 16 is wonderful today and uh, listen to the message it's, it's great as well as the so please join me in prayer. Um, Lord, thank you for this day and for this gathering in person and on Zoom. Please be with our speaker, Christine Jeske, and help her to articulate the message she wants to bring to us. And thank you for her being with us. Lord, as many people that are present are probably as many concerns and more, and we hope as many praises as that too. But we do want to lift up Carol and Bruce Chambers as they trek continue, they, they continue to trek through Carol's cancer treatment. Please completely heal her and bring them the peace and comfort that only you can give. We also lift up our Kathy Pitts with COVID and pray her symptoms will be mild and she will be well soon. And Lord, please bless. Um, also, I just want to lift up Anita, who's been our helper. She's not feeling well today. Lord, please bless all our young families and children with health and much more in their busy days. We anticipate a healthy birth of a new Lejano family member in March. Lord, in this world, there may not be peace, but we do wish for it. Please help us to keep our eyes on you. And as Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. He who promised is faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Marilyn. On to the children. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. Um, Good. All right, well, welcome to Vox, everybody that's live and on Zoom and everything like that. Good to have you all here. I'm Bob. I'll be the, kind of the host for the time. So. Um, got a lot of fun things planned for today, uh, but our values, always good to remind ourselves of those again, so you see them up on the screen. Uh, three core things that are very important to us. We believe the church exists to love and serve the world, not stand in judgment of it. We believe that the church should be the safest place to talk about anything, and that the church should capture the hearts and minds of the next generation. Uh, so we're going to do a lot of the standard stuff today. We'll do uh, some breakout rooms. Uh, we'll read the same scripture three times over. The scripture is Psalm 16. Uh, so feel free if you want to pull that out uh, and take a look at that when you read that. And then we'll do communion as well. So if you're on Zoom, you know, grab whatever elements that you want for that. Uh, you know, here we'll do you know, we've got coffee and donuts or whatever we'll use for that here. Uh, and then I'm particularly excited about our speaker this morning. Christine, thank you for joining us. Uh, really fun to have Christine here. I'll tell you more about her, but uh, uh, yeah, really, really fun to have Christine here. So uh, let's get started then. Let's go uh, to Steve now, the other half of the Nomar family. Oh, we're making it up. Is it you? All right. Uh, so Joanne is going to do uh, the NID, right? Or not? Uh, oh. Go for it. What's up first here? Well, that's okay, David. And I <laughs> keep me safe, my God, according to your mercy for me. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom all is, is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. 
I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods, but take up your wounds. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16. Awesome. Thank you, David. We'll hear that same one a couple other times, but we got like I said, we got a lot of things going on here in the new year, I think. So, Casey, I think you're doing announcements, right? That I am. Good morning, everyone. Um, so happy birthday to our dis whoa, I forgot to change that to January, but I do at least have the right January birthdays. <laughs> Seems like there's always that one thing I miss when I'm putting together this slide. So uh Steve just celebrated his birthday last week. Happy birthday, Steve, and thank you for sharing your laptop today. <clears throat> Uh, we got Brandon Metcalf today, so if you got his number, maybe reach out and say happy birthday to Brandon. Uh, the one and only Jonathan Salt coming up here in a couple days. And uh, yeah, our good friend Rob will be on the 19th. So uh, if you're looking for a birthday shout out, make sure and sign up so we can... Uh, Say happy birthday birthday to you all month. All right, upcoming Sundays next. Next Sunday will be an all virtual service um, with Bonnie. So th this will be, uh, she's going to be with us six times this year instead of the, the usual 12 like we had her the previous years. Um, but still excited to, that she'll be joining us more regularly. Um, and then the following Sunday, the 28th, we'll be at our house, the Olsons, uh, starting off our series on the, the book of Luke. Um, but with that, we got the, there is the book, The Lost, shoot, I was just talking about The Lost Letters of, <laughs> what's the name of the city? <laughs> All right. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> The Lost Letters of Pergamum. Uh, I do still have extra copies of that book. Um, if you don't have one, uh, shoot me a text or an email and, and we can arrange to get you a copy so you can read that ahead of the 28th is when we're going to go over that book. Then we'll have House Church at the West where we do a deeper dive into what uh, Tim teaches us on the 28th. That'll happen on the 4th back at the West House where you're at right now. And then, yeah, excited to have Jack West back with us on February 11th. Uh, he'll be joining us from Tennessee. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, been a couple years, but Jack's there and settled and um, excited to have him back. And uh, if you haven't had the opportunity yet and would like to, we've got a meal train going for Carol and Bruce as Carol uh, recovers from her surgeries. So yeah, no, uh, we're going to take a, a break this month from our men's and women's hangouts, but that'll resume in February, dates to come. And then our next planning meeting will be uh, the very end of the month, January 31st at 7 p.m. Um, looking forward to planning out the month of February there. And I believe that's it for the announcements. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Casey. Um, any before we move on, anything that we forgot that anybody else knows about? <laughs> Sometimes things pop up. So okay, great. Thanks, Casey. So let's move into communion now, and then we're gonna do the scripture, next scripture, and then hear from Christine. Um, so I thought uh, as we get into it, I'll pray, and then uh, wanna let me read from Luke twenty-two. So this is the story of the Last Supper. Um, and here's what it says in Luke twenty-two seventeen. 17. 
Uh, after taking the cup, he, Jesus, gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I think we've got a video from Stella, which would be fantastic. So just as we, we listen to this um, together, let's be reminded that this is a tradition that the church has celebrated for thousands of years. And even before that, the, the Jewish community celebrated Passover, um, remembrance of God's love, care, concern, and sacrifice for us. So whatever you use, uh, your elements, uh, yeah, let's have at it. Thank you, Stella. I always love the ukulele. Um, so who, who does have, do you have the message? All right, there we go. Now we got to yeah. go in. All right, so here goes Psalm 16 from the message. <laughs> Keep me faithful, God. I render my life to you. I say to God, be my Lord. Without you, nothing makes sense. And these God-chosen lives all around, what splendid friends they make. Don't just go shopping for God. Gods are not for sale. I swear I've never, I'll never treat God names like brand names. My choice is you, God, first and only. And, and now I find I'm your choice. You set me up with, with a house and yard, and then you make me your hair. The, the wise counsel God gives when I'm awake is confirmed by my sleeping heart. Day and night, I'll stick with God. I've got a good thing going, and I'm not letting go. I'm happy from the inside out, and from the outside in, I'm firm, firmly formed. You've canceled my ticket to hell. That's not my destination. Now you've got my feet on the life path, all radiant from the shining of your face. Ever since you took my hand, I'm on the right way. Psalm 16. Hmm. Always interesting in the message. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think we have one more of that. Who's reading the third one? So uh, next we've got our speaker, and then we're going to do some breakout rooms after that. So, you know, I think one of the things that Jill and I love doing is, you know, introducing, you know, friends and people that we've known to you all. You remember our, you know, our friend Spud came and remember, but um so Christine, uh, excited to have Christine Jeske here, Dr. Christine Jeske. So she was a student uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison during her, during her undergrad when Jill and I were working with Campus Crusade for Christ there. So uh, we knew her as a freshman, and she has since gone on to do amazing things. Uh, she's been doing amazing things as a college student, too. And I believe, was she in one of the small groups that you were leading there? Yeah, I was just there a year. So just I think, and I think it was Christine's senior year. She no, really? Her. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> well, either way, uh, so since then, uh, she went on to earn an MBA in international economic development, a PhD in cultural anthropology. Uh, she is the author of three books. And I I think recently kind of reconnected with her because, well, we're friends on Facebook, right? We're friends with you know, hundreds of people, probably. Um, and so kind of stay connected that way. And then she recently, maybe within the last year, year or two, started writing uh, like a monthly newsletter all about issues of racial justice and racial reconciliation and things like that. Uh, and the newsletter is called Listening While White. Uh, and so I'm white and I want to listen. And so I thought, this is perfect. Um, so, and it's been awesome. And I thought, oh, Christine, we need you to come and speak to our church. And so very excited to have Christine Jeske here. So Christine, take it away. <laughs> uh oh, are you muted? Oh, there we I found it. I just had to find the mute button. It was kind of buried. Right. Uh, so good to see you all. Uh, Bob, it's fun to see you again. My goodness. I see your pictures <laughs> on Facebook, but this is like as close as we get to reuniting in person. So I'll take hello, it. Hello. Yeah. Um, it's great to be here with you all. And um, I, I'm grateful for this space. What a neat group of people. And I love the sort of informality. Uh, like Bob said, I, um, I he didn't say detail. I was telling some people beforehand, I lived in Nicaragua and then China and then South Africa for about a decade. Uh, and a lot of those years we had 
little informal churches of various sizes and shapes inside houses and stuff. So this feels very at home for me. So let's get started. So I wanted to begin with a question for you. Have you ever reached a point in life when you ran out of hope? And I wanted to start with a story of a time when I felt that way. In 2008, I had been living in South Africa for about three years with my husband and two kids. I was teaching at a seminary where students from all over the African continent came to get trained as pastors and missionaries and church leaders. And as you may recall, one of the big things happening in 2008 was a global recession, which was having repercussions on the financial situation of that seminary all the way across the world in South Africa. But more importantly, the seminary had just chosen its first black president. And it turned out that there were a lot of white people with a lot of money and influence who didn't like that decision. They called it reverse racism and they predicted the downfall of the seminary because of this choice, which they then brought about by telling all the donors that they should pull their money. And so finances at this seminary were bleak. Faculty and staff were going months without pay. Even more heartbreaking was when students were finding out that the scholarships that they'd been promised to get through their decade, their degrees were suddenly gone. And these were not students who really had any other options. Many of them had saved for years to be here uh, through church offerings that would yield about $10 a week. We were living in the seminary apartments alongside these students. And next door to us, for example, was a Congolese family who had fled war who could only afford to send one of their three children to school at a time. Next door, there was a Nigerian family with five teenagers living in a two bedroom apartment. There was a Burundian family who welcomed in so many orphan children that I actually lost count of who lived there and so on in every single apartment. And my husband's full-time job became basically raising money for the seminary, but it was tough. We were looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars of budget and these students were getting like $10 donations from their friends. So one afternoon, seminary students decided to hold a prayer meeting. We gathered in a barrack classroom, pulling up chairs into a circle and packing in shoulder to shoulder. And as was customary, everyone began praying at once, quietly at first, naming the attributes of God, and then slowly rising in volume together until it was like a pounding waterfall that must have echoed across the entire campus. And I closed my eyes and began dutifully speaking prayerful words asking God to somehow solve this crisis. And as some background, it wasn't the first time that I had seen some pretty tough financial situations. After college, where I met Bob and Jill with crew, I got married and my husband and I lived in Nicaragua for a year. We lived in China for two years and we worked with organizations dealing with poverty. And I felt like I was supposed to know how to pray about racism, and poverty and hardships. But as I sat up there in that river of prayer, I realized something. I didn't have any hope left. I didn't expect God to solve this. I didn't even know how to imagine any way forward. The problem was so big. It wasn't just about money for students. It was about the racism behind the funding crisis and the wars that these students had come from and the colonization of the whole continent and the whole system of Wall Street investments and so on and so on. And I just stopped moving my mouth and I went silent. My hope was done. Have you ever run out of hope? Maybe for you, it happened some bleak night in the middle of a crisis of mental health or addiction or a marriage falling apart. Maybe it came on gradually, like falling into debt, giving up caring about your job. Maybe you tried to make your community a better place in some seemingly small but significant way. And after knocking on thousands of doors and hearing a thousand no's, you faced defeat. Maybe you don't even know anymore what needed to happen, and maybe nobody does. I want to talk together about what to do when we are facing big, big problems like this, and our hope is done. This talk is kind of a downer compared to your nice psalm. I'm so glad you had a cheerful psalm today, right? Um, but stick with me, because I think we need to go there. Because I think the problem that I want to talk about it isn't just that we sometimes run out of hope. I think it's that a lot of us are trying to make it through life on the wrong kind of hope. And it's a hope that damages us and the people around us. But if we can scour away that false hope, there's a kind of real hope waiting for us. So 
this story of running out of hope in South Africa, it actually came back to me a couple years ago because I started hearing a lot of people telling stories like that. To fill you in on how I got there, so nine months after that prayer meeting, the seminary did in fact close its doors. Some students transferred, some never finished their degrees. And our family moved back to the United States. And after some searching and various jobs, I did a PhD in anthropology, like Bob mentioned. Which if you're not sure, if you're not familiar, anthropology means studying how culture affects everything we do. It's kind of like really slow journalism that involves a lot of hanging out and listening to people. And I wrote three books. Two of them were about racism in South Africa. And then I thought, you know what I really want to learn about more? What can Christians like myself actually do about racism? And I wanted to focus on that question in my research because as you may know, the track record for white Christians like myself, in particular on racial justice is not exactly hope inspiring. White Christians are much less likely than white people in general to believe that racism is a problem and wanna do something about it. There's all kinds of statistics showing this to be true. So I wanted to research white Christians who do care and the people of color that they interact with and figure out how do they stay motivated when clearly most people in their demographics are not. I did this by, uh, I started out by asking 30 Christians of color to talk about what they believed racial justice should look like. And then I asked them to recommend white people that they considered to have long-term commitments to racial justice. And of those recommendations, I then interviewed about 40 white Christians as well. So today, I want to tell you some of what I learned from that research. You can sign up for my newsletter if you want to. That's not a selfless plug. I will mention it's actually not called uh, Listening While White anymore. I just relaunched it and called it Just Learning. So anyway, it's on sub Substack if you want to find it. Um, but uh, anyway, so from that research, I'll tell you a little bit of that. And I want to relate it to scripture today. And I want to ultimately get at this question of how we hope. Because one of the first things that I noticed in those interviews was that people kept talking about hope. In particular, when I asked white Christians what were the biggest changes over the years that they'd spent learning and becoming people who act against racial injustice, I asked what changed, and they said often what changed was how they hoped. Let me just read a quote from one white woman. Now, she's super enthusiastic. She was talking about what she learned from a uh, predominantly black church. And she talked with all kinds of hand gestures and energy and just like pounding on her table. So let me try to convey some of that energy as I read what she said. She said, you could just be like, oh, good God, it's so bad. And yet, how is it? And she's like pounding on the table that people in this church don't just crumble. Their hope is in something different. And it's a different kind of hope. It's nothing that I was told. Like I was told, oh, if you work hard enough, you can get whatever you want. And how do you make it in the face of all the systemic ways that everything is and still stand and not just cave? That is a whole different reservoir. It's something that I just want to be close to. I just want to draw from that. Then a great quote. So what I want to talk about is what is that whole different reservoir? And we're going to get to scripture on this, but first I want to set us up by pointing out that there are a lot of different kinds of hope. I found one scholarly article that had gone through and counted definitions of hope in other research and found 54 different definitions of hope. So there's a lot of angles at how we understand hope, what we think it means, how we do it. I want you to think for a second, how would you fill in this sentence? I used to hope blank, but now I hope blank. In our discussion, maybe we'll come back to that question. So you can be thinking about it. I used to hope blank, but now I hope blank. Maybe your first thought is to fill in something you hope for, like a good job or a healthy body. I encourage you also to try to fill in an adverb, how you hoped. I used to hope furtively, naively, optimistically, occasionally, directly, radically, tenaciously, but now I hope in a different way, perhaps. So you might be like, cool, I got the point of this sermon. I've got my good adverbs. I'm going to get up tomorrow and hope radically and tenaciously, right? Um, but I want to throw in a little complication to this also. My job as a social scientist is often to raise my hand and be like, uh, wait a second, what about culture? 
What about the social setting? <laughs> so this is one of those times. We tend to vastly underestimate how much influence our social world has on us. And this is absolutely true about hope. Hope is a sort of contagious thing. We pick up our hopes and our despairs from people around us. We realized this during the pandemic, didn't we? Remember when we were putting up those signs in our yards thing, saying things like, hold on to hope, and we're painting murals about hope and flying it over detention centers literally in the air because we can give and receive hope. So part of how we need to reshape our hopes is maybe to put ourselves in communities of people who can show us how to hope. And that's cool, but we don't always have control over what kind of hope the social world gives us. Your hope is affected by whether you grew up hungry or well-fed, whether your parents spent their time in rehab or incarceration or ski resorts and summer homes. Your hope is shaped by whether your ancestors were indigenous people who had their land stolen or African people who had their lives made into property or white people who stole that land and profited from that property, or some complicated mix of all of those. All of these social factors train us in how to hope. And there are many kinds of hope that come from those social experiences, but I wanna focus in on one that my research ended up showing me a lot about. It's a kind of hope that I wanna call white supremacist hope. And what I mean by that is not that it's like ugly racist people who believe this, but it's a way of hoping that has infected society, that has the effect of upholding white people above other people in society, of creating imbalances and then keeping those balances in, imbalances in place. It's a kind of subset of something that we could call just supremacist hope. Because there's been hope like this around longer than white people have been calling themselves white. In fact, that brings us to a first scripture passage I want to talk about today. So you can see this kind of what I call supremacist hope way back in the story of Israel. There's a story of this in 1 Kings chapter 22. You can turn there if you want to, but I'm just going to summarize it because it's kind of a longer story. 1 Kings chapter 22. And it exemplifies this kind of hope. So here's the story. There's this king of Israel at the time. His name is Ahab, and he is terrible. And lots of kings before him were also terrible. And one day Ahab notices that there is some land called Ramoth Gilead that used to be conquered by Israel. And now their power over it is slipping and he's bothered by that. So Ahab, the bad king, calls up another king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And he asks Jehoshaphat to go attack and reconquer this place with him. Now Jehoshaphat, thankfully, is a little bit more God-fearing. And so he says, okay... But first we should consult with God. And Ahab is like, sure, I happen to have these 400 prophets who work for me and they're great. These 400 prophets will tell us what to do. So the 400 prophets come and they say, yeah, Ahab, go. You're going to win the battle, Ahab. Uh, but Jehoshaphat smells something fishy here. And he says, wait a second. Do you actually have anyone who is a prophet of the Lord? And Ahab says, and I love this line in the Bible. I can, I, because I can picture him like pouting as he says it. And I want to read it straight from chapter 22, verse eight. Ahab says, there is this one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never says anything good about me, but always bad. <laughs> so they do bring this prophet. His name is Micaiah. And sure enough, he prophesied that God is going to destroy Ahab and all of Israel. So Ahab flies into a rage and threatens to put this prophet, Micaiah, in prison until he returns victorious from battle. Now, Micaiah, another line I just love, is super snarky. And he's like, sure, but if you return from battle victorious, God has not spoken through me. <laughs> it's kind of like, good luck, Ahab. And Ahab goes to war anyway, even though Micaiah and the Lord has told him not to. Uh, and Ahab is scared. He realizes that as a king, he is likely to be killed. So he disguises himself as an ordinary citizen, thinking he'll be safer. But even then, a stray arrow comes and shoots him through a crack in his armor, and he dies a disgraceful death. Interesting story, right? Did you know that was in the Bible? I never heard a sermon on that one, but I thought it was interesting. Um, because Ahab has what I would call supremacist hope. If you take a look at it and see if you've seen things like this today. so. 
in summary, Ahab only wants good news that's favorable for himself. He surrounds himself with messengers who will help him block out the realities that he doesn't like. He expects trouble should resolve itself easily, just like a little battle, kind of like a half hour sitcom kind of a battle. He wants to hold on to power, or better yet, go back to some mythical past when he had even more power. He wants to be safe on the sidelines because he's actually terrified of real danger. He's used to having a palace and armor protecting him from real suffering. He's in denial about the ways he has harmed other people. He's terrified of being exposed or humbled, and he definitely doesn't want to have to ask for forgiveness or repent or change. He wants a future that is basically more the same, more control, more power, more of himself. And I think we've seen hope like that. And some of us have lived in it. I think we all do at times. You've probably seen that kind of hope in, for example, some responses to racism. When white people want the problem of racism to just go away, sweep it under the rug, bring in some prophets who won't say such bad things, stay out of danger of suffering, keep the power structure as it is, maybe give a little charity money to people who are suffering, but always be the one giving, not the one needing. Tell the people who are suffering to just put on a happy face and press on and things will get better. Progress is coming because surely it always has for white people. Keep America great, or at least bring back sometime what was even greater for white people. And repentance? Grace? Who said we need anything like that? Just bring more of the same. You've probably seen hope like that, right? And I want to be clear, hope like that actually harms people. One person who saw this very clearly was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose ho holiday we celebrate this week. He talked about hope in almost every sermon, and one place we can find this is in his letter from a Birmingham jail, because actually he wrote it in response to white clergy leaders who wrote to him about hope. So after he was imprisoned, there was this open letter published by clergy, and they wrote this. Here's a quote from it. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized. But we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. They urged the city to stop demonstrating and said, we do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified. And from his jail cell, King typed back his famous letter and it's full of honest reflection on how to hope. He wrote, maybe I was too optimistic. Maybe I expected too much. I guess I should have realized that few members of a race that has oppressed another race can understand or appreciate the deep groans and passionate yearnings of those who have been oppressed and still have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. A few pages later, he repeated again, maybe I have been too optimistic. Now, one of the most widely quoted phrases from Dr. King's writing is the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Maybe you've seen this. It's on plaques. It was on the Oval Office floor. And often when people quote that, they say it kind of implying that people should wait and things will get better automatically. But in his Birmingham jail letter, King spent paragraphs explaining that is absolutely not what he meant. He wrote, we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through tireless efforts and persistent work of people willing to be co-workers with God. So he wasn't just disappointed that people didn't show up to support Black justice. He was disappointed that they hoped for it with a dangerous kind of hope. Bad hope doesn't just leave you a little bit disappointed in the morning. It actually harms people and keeps you from being co-workers with God. So what does real hope look like? Let's look at some more scripture. We're going to look at two more short verses from the New Testament letters that were both written at times when early Christians were starting to get imprisoned and killed off one by one. So hope and a loss of hope was a big deal. First, let's just read, and I'm just going to read it. You can look it up if you want. I'm going to read part of Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. We also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us. And I would say that kind of hope does not disappoint us. So what kind of hope is that? In good preacherly fashion, I want to point out three things to know about real hope. So uh, first, 
real hope acknowledges the bad. Real hope has suffered. We see that in this verse. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. I once found a definition of optimism from a psychologist who said that optimism is distancing yourself from the bad. And to me, that definition makes it really stark why Christians need a hope that is not just optimism, because we can't distance ourselves from the bad. We have to go there. We have to lament the bad. We have to see it, even experience it like Christ himself did, persevere through it, because that's where we build real hope. So first, real hope acknowledges the bad. Secondly, real hope does not draw a trajectory from the bad into the future. And this is actually really unusual if you think about how people use the word hope. I was at an event recently where somebody asked a speaker, tell us what gives you hope these days. And I realized, I think what they really meant was, tell us about the good things that are happening lately. But the hope of the Bible doesn't have anything to do with whether or not good things are happening lately. If you think about people in the Bible like Moses or Esther or Mary, whose immediate surroundings gave them every reason not to hope, but they were incredibly hopeful. Maybe people in your life are going through experiences like that. Maybe not the same thing, but it's like uh, Moses being enslaved or maybe Esther uh, when the latest queen in her position had just gotten banished or maybe like Mary, there's about to be a genocide out to kill your baby. But real hope is not based on projections of what's going on in the present. One woman I talked with in my research put it this way. She said, Look, the track record isn't good. If I have to trust in humanity to do the right thing, I am not voting on humanity. So real hope acknowledges the bad, and it doesn't project based on the bad present circumstances, bad or good. So thirdly, what does hope project based on? The third thing to know about real hope is this. It expects only one thing, and that is the interruption of God's grace. Listen here to one other short verse that I said was coming. 1 Peter 1.13 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, discipline yourselves, set all your hope fully on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Set all your hope fully on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring. Fully on grace. Not just a little bit of hope in technology and a little bit of hope in the nice weather and a little bit of hope in the nice feeling in your belly from your coffee, but really fully on grace. And how do you do that? So here's something really cool that I want to tell you about from my research. Remember I said I interviewed these 70 people and I went back and I cataloged what do people who stick with a long-term commitment to racial justice share in common? And I looked especially at white people because it's less common for them and it's easier for them to just walk away and not have to think about racial justice. Now, some of what I found was what you probably expect in their lives. They often had come face to face with injustice in heartbreaking ways. So they had actually experienced the bad like that. Um, and they'd often spent a lot of intentional effort learning how racism works in society. But what I found was that's not enough by itself. Because what happened there in that process of like their white supremacist hopes getting stripped away, they found themselves wrestling with hope in new ways. They came to these places like we started out thinking about where they saw just how big problems in society are and their hopes were chipped down to little bits, kind of like me in that prayer room. But there's something else they talked about, and I'm convinced it is a key to real hope. They knew grace. They had lived it in their bones. And here's what I mean by that. So there was another anthropologist who did a similar study to mine, except that his was with white people who were pretty new to social justice. And he found that people kept talking about how discouraged they got. And I noticed in every single quote in his article, when people mentioned grace, they talked about it as something for other people in need. It was like, oh, we gave so much grace to these poor people and they didn't even thank us. But that's not what I heard from people in my study. They flipped grace around. So the white people and the people in power in my study said they had received grace from God and from people who had every reason to hate them. 
Let me tell you a story of how this played out. So there was a white woman that I interviewed who grew up pretty ignorant of racism and she worked as a teacher and she was trying to learn about racism, but recently she had been called out for a role in some racist incidents when this story happened. And one day she was feeling especially discouraged and she heard about this talk about racism by a black pastor in town. She was not a Christian, hadn't ever gone to a church, but she went to hear this talk. And this is what she said about it. Here's her quote. I mean, I get a little weepy thinking about it still. I remember how I felt. I was like, wow, I don't know what's happening here, but I feel like I belong here. I feel like there's something hopeful here because I just felt so horrible. And I just thought, here's this black man appealing to white people, believing in, like believing in white people that like, if you just educate them and give them space to do their best, they could that could really happen. And I wanted to be a part of that. And then she told me that after this event, the pastor invited people to come and talk to him further. And she took up that invitation and talked with him, told him about the racist incident that had happened at work. And here's what she said about that. She said, I'll never forget the grace he had with me in that moment. I didn't know what grace was, but you know, as time has gone on, when I look back at it, it's ever more profound, like understanding how effed up we actually are. And yet he's still, and then her voice kind of trailed off. Now she wasn't a Christian at the time, but she ended up becoming a Christian through this black church. And isn't that a great definition of grace? How effed up we actually are, and yet he's still. That's grace. So here's this woman, and there were many others like her that I got to talk to her, talk to, who had done the learning, who had acknowledged the bad, who knew this whole history of unrepayable debts for ancestors who had stolen and murdered and enslaved and colonized their way to power and wealth. And she knew how messed up her own personal life had been too. She knew these problems were so, so big. And in the midst of that mess, she found grace. And that grace from this pastor became like a signpost to God's grace. And knowing God works like that became a signpost to hope. So just to clarify, I'm not talking about forced Black forgiveness. Like, oh, people of color, why don't you just get over it and forgive people, white people, so we can just move on. What people talked about was a grace that only comes because Jesus could do this. And it's hard. Here's a quote from a Black man who was talking to me about grace. He said, I'm just saying from a Black person's lens, I'm thinking, why should I forgive? Why should I have to educate these people? Why should I forgive them? Like why? They've done this and that, that's wrong, whatever. And all of this is true, 100%. Systemic racism, divided families, slavery, you can't deny it. But as my faith would tell me, our call as Christians is to make sure that we step above that and forgive even when we don't wanna forgive. Or where does it stop? Where does the pain stop? How do you grow? And if our thing is reconciliation to Jesus and reconciliation to the Father, and that's through unity, that's through love, the only way we can do that is by grace. So real grace, like he's talking about, is an undeserved gift that starts with Jesus and goes out to make receivers who become givers. The recipient doesn't get to force grace. As one white man that I met put it, you don't get to demand grace. If you do, you miss the whole point. As soon as you say, hey, I deserve grace, that's not grace anymore. Grace anticipates a relationship. It doesn't let people off the hook. It actually hooks them into relationships that they can't give up on. It interrupts big, big problems where we would expect to find ongoing hatred and instead interrupts with something very good. And there is hope in that. So that kind of hope that's built on grace is tough as all get out. It is honest and flexible and improvisational. And I want to quote, close with a quote from an Asian American Christian woman who I interviewed who described that kind of real grace infused hope like this. She said, I would probably describe myself as either a really hopeful pessimist or a crabby optimist. I find no hope in not naming what is really happening. I think I am fundamentally a person of hope, but not because of me personally, but because I live in these faith traditions. It's not shiny or happy at all. It's totally bruised and bloodied and it's scraping by like by my fingernails. On days it's like you might not be able to see it, but there's a scrap of it hanging on and pressing on. And so my hope for you and my prayer for you today is that you would have that kind of hope in the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So that's what I have for you. I hear that you often have conversation time. So I also have uh, some conversation questions that we can use to prompt discussion if that's uh, what you usually do next. Is that cool? I love it. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So yeah, normally what we do is we uh, take some time as a community to process what we've learned and uh, and kind of talk about it. So yeah, if you've got some questions you want to throw out, that would be fantastic. That sounds great. You know what? Let me actually just kind of pray for you all for just a minute here too. Thanks. Yeah. Um, God, I thank you for this group of people. God, I pray that you would move uh, through this group of people and really give them enduring hope. Um, show them how to find that in the most hopeless moments of their lives and the most hopeless struggles of their lives that might be present or things that they've kind of tucked away from their past or are about to encounter in their future. God, I pray that you would infuse them with your grace. Uh, Show them how to find that in their everyday interactions, these signposts to your grace that is um, that is the path forward and um, and the whole path that we're a part of. It's our journey with you. Um, God, I pray that you lead us in discussion today, uh, that your Holy Spirit would be um, meeting them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so if you want to, I don't know if we have those on a yeah. slide or if you want to just kind of throw those out and we'll... Uh... I think I got it here. Is that a uh, share screen with y'all? That would be great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we got it. We can see it. Okay. So I'll let you just run with that. <laughs> Sounds good. So I'll read the question. You want to read them? Yeah. So uh, have you ever run out of hope? What was that experience like? Discuss how you would fill in this sentence. I used to hope blank. Now I want to hope blank. And can you recall a time when your life trajectory was interrupted by grace? some kind of undeserved gift from God or someone else. How did that grace point you to real hope? I love it. Yeah, good. So what we'll do, I think, on Zoom is, I don't know, let's take maybe like uh, more like 15 minutes or so. Uh, so for the Zoom folks, I think, uh, I forget who our Zoom master is, maybe Barbara, if you want to kind of put those groups together, and then we'll break up and maybe a couple of groups here. We'll see what our group member want to do here. And then we'll see everybody back in 15 minutes, and then we'll finish up with our last scripture reading and everything. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, really, really great to see you. That was great stuff. Okay. All right. Any questions? Everybody good? Oh, and Christine, I don't know if you can still hear me. You're welcome to join in on one of the groups if you want to. So uh, it's up to you, whatever it works best for you. You're muted now. So. Can you hear me? Liz, I don't know. I think if I join a room, it will stop sharing. So I think I'm going to not join a room. Um, oh, that's but I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll be here. I'll just mute myself for a bit. Maybe Whatever. someone yeah. can take a snapshot from the Steve's uh, laptop. Maybe, maybe take a snapshot. Oh, yeah. And then Christine, if you'd love to join us, that would be great. Okay, sure. What do you mean take a snapshot? Like, you know, take an image so someone can look on their phone, uh, the questions. Oh, I see. Yeah, if you're in the group, yeah, make sure you've got the, the questions on your phone. Is that... <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll just join. That's true. Yeah, and Jill just said, Christine, you, you might be surprised that whether we have the questions or not, we we always find things to talk about. So, whether she's there. Oh, I see. Your presence will shut down conversation. That's true. Yeah, so your yeah, your presence will not shut down conversation. It probably would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Break our rooms. See you back here in fifteen. Way more time, way more time to chat about these things. Uh, this, this is really good. Uh, I think the certainly the general agreement here, Christine, is uh, super powerful and loved what you had to say. So excited, uh, hopefully more. Uh, but let's go to who's doing New America Standard? Julie, right? All right. Julie's got this one. Protecting Ukraine. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have nothing good to speak to you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the majestic ones. All my delight is in them. The pains of those who have acquired another God will be multiplied. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The measuring lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, my inheritance is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has advised me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my God is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will 
my flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to shield. You will not allow your Holy One to overlook it. You will make known to me the way of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasure and pleasure. Um, hey, before we, we finish up and we have Jill do the, the benediction here, uh, is Christine still on? Are you still here? So, Christine, a, a couple of things. One is, if you would mind, uh, tell us a, a you know how how we can maybe um, you know continue on uh, like to follow you and your writing. You know, so how can we access your uh, your your writing? And then would there be maybe a, a book or two or a resource, another resource you might recommend for us? Yeah. Uh, so the um, if you want to follow my newsletter, the easiest way to find it probably is just do christinejuski.com. And there will be links on there to sign up for my newsletter. Or if you use Substack already, that's the platform it goes through. So you can search for me through Substack, but just my name, christinejuski.com. Um, and I write about every two weeks or something like that. Um, oh, books and resources, man, where to begin? Um, it's hard because I, I read them all. <laughs> I research, I read so many. Um, I, I yeah, guess I on the, thought and, yeah. yeah. Maybe, um, I mean, you can find my books, but I don't have anything out yet as a book that's on this. I'm, you can pray for me because I'm writing it into a book right now. It should be out with IVP in like a year and a half. So it's got a ways. Um, but, um, I mean, Damar Tisby's work I find is really helpful in terms of if you want to learn some basic things about how to be a Christian engaged with racial justice, he does a good job of overviewing like the history and then practical steps. So Jamar Tisby, and he's written a couple different books um, about racism, but I'll leave you that if you want something on race. Um, if you want something on forgiveness, Miroslav Volf is my favorite. And if you want something on hope, mm, I don't have one on that. <laughs> I was going to recommend one and I was like, no, actually that one, I disagree with about half of the book. So I won't recommend oh, that. Right, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you. Honor. It was uh, super fun to have you and uh, hopefully we'll have you back sometime. I think everybody would love that. Um, so with that, uh, Jill, you want to do our benediction? Uh, benediction. So I was brushing my teeth this morning and I, I thought, oh, I'm doing the benediction. Should I do the one we usually do? which is usually my, my thing too. Um, and then this verse pops into my mind and it kind of fits today. So mm -hmm. I'm glad I thought of it. Thank you. Um, this is Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Perfect. 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 Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Next week, I'll be all Zoom. Oh, round of applause. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. It's been a real gift to be with y'all. This has been fun. So don't forget next week, all Zoom with Bonnie. Uh, have a great week. Uh, what a great way to bring send a Martin Luther King uh, Day tomorrow too. So all right, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Christine, happy fort building. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stella. Stay warm. <laughs> we go put on some very warm clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so again, much. Christine. That was great. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.